And I'm going to introduce um, the two wonderful facilitators of these panels, starting with this track and the Native Fiber Systems panel, um, Tashina Parker, um, who is with us, you can see today. Um, she is mixed California native um, of the Yosemite Southern Sierra Miwok and the Yosemite Mono Lake um, Paiute. Um, Tashina, I wanted to make sure I pronounced this right. Kukadi Kadi? Oh, I might have. Kukadi Kadi. Okay, so the Mono Lake Kukadi Kadi Paiute from her grandfather's lineage and the Kashaya Pomo from her grandmother's lineage. Tashina grew up in her tribal community of Yosemite with a family practicing the traditional cultural ceremonies, traditional foodways, and basketry. She has a background in community arts education and has worked for over 10 years with a variety of intertribal arts and activist social justice organizations in the San Francisco Bay Area, including seventh Native American generation um, B-A-A-I-T-S, Bates Two-Spirit, Powwow, and Dancing Earth. Tashina holds a Bachelor of Arts in Community Studies from UC Santa Cruz with an emphasis in arts education, working with immigrant communities, and she has um, a BFA in Fashion Textile Design from California College of the Arts, where she graduated with highest class honors of emerging talent. Tashina has worked professionally in the fashion industry with various corporate brands, as well as local brands producing and manufacturing in San Francisco. So Tashina and I met when she was at California College of the Arts and I have been a long standing um, fan of the work of her grandmother, Julia Parker, since I was a young girl learning about the, the bounty and the richness of native fiber tradition in California. Um, so it's an honor that Tashina is here with us today and I'm very grateful for all the panelists that she has um, brought together as well. And um, before we dive into the Native Fiber Systems panel, I'm gonna just introduce uh, Crystal uh, Moody Wood, who you can't see, she's in the adjacent stream, uh, the plastic flow uh, conversation. So Crystal, again, who's not featured right here immediately, um, she is the founder and principal consultant of Matter Evolve, a company driven to lead the evolution of our materials world. Matter Evolve's mission is to develop and scale innovative regenerative textile systems through the lens of soil, sea, and circularity. By designing nature forward experiential learning programs and providing technical consulting to the textile sector and fostering trailblazing collaborations between science, industry, government, and the nonprofit sector. So Crystal um, will be facilitating the um, following the plastic flow panel. So the links, I'm gonna give you a moment. The link should be in the chat if you um, wanna take a moment. Um, it's going in right now, Rebecca, here it is. This is the uh, link to the other chat, to the other webinar. If you would like to go to the other webinar and remember everybody, if you get to the other webinar and you would like to come back, there will be a link in the chat as well too to bring you back here if you'd like to bounce between the two. Perfect, thanks Gavin. All right, Tashina, I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm gonna mute myself and thank you so much. Thank you, Louie, thank you, Fred, thank you, Alice. So grateful for your participation here today. All right. Thanks, Rebecca, for the beautiful introduction. So honored to be here today. Um, I am a great fan of uh, Fibershed and Rebecca's work and um, find that the mission and the purpose is just speaks directly to my soul and also to native practices within fiber. So today I'm really honored to bring together this amazing, brilliant panel of um, native people working within fiber and traditional arts and to um, talk about what they have to bring to the world. And we have Louis Garcia, who's Pueblo, Alice Lincoln Cook, Kirok, chairperson of uh, California Native Basket Weavers Association, and Fred Briones Pomo of the Native Fiber Project and also of SIBA. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and read their bios real quick and then each one of them will present their work to you. And at the very end, we'll have a Q&A session and um, 
get to dig a little bit deeper into what their work is like. So Luis Garcia is Pueblo fiber artist of Tijuana and Puro heritage from Southern New Mexico. His Pueblo ancestors have cultivated and hand, hand processed cotton and other natural fibers for over a thousand years. Louis continues his tradition of planting and processing heritage varieties of both white and natural colored cotton strains in his home garden in Albuquerque, New Mexico. For traditional uses, including spinning and weaving of traditional cer cer and ceremonial Pueblo clothing. And he's also a very, very talented weaver. And I've been seeing some of his work um, out there on the Facebook and it's so beautiful and inspiring. Um, we also have Alice Lincoln Cook, Karak, chairperson of the California Indian Basket Weavers Association. Alice is proudly served on the SIBO Board of Directors for two terms. She is a member of the Karak tribe and worked for over 20 years as an independent artist making traditional jewelry and weaving Karak style baskets. She teaches basket weaving to local tribal members in, at her store, the Kalamath Book Nook, which where I think that's where she is coming from today in the town of Klamath, California. In addition, she works with local schools and other institutions and events throughout the Pacific Northwest region. Alice was instrumental in reviving SEBA's following the SMOKE program and building valuable partnerships with local, state, and federal agencies. And last but not least, we have Fred Briones, Pomo of the Native Fiber Project and also a board member of SEBA. Fred is an enrolled tribal member of the Big Valley Rancheria Band of Pomo Indians. Fred has been weaving baskets for the past 20 years and was inspired to begin weaving by his grandmother who reminded him of the power of baskets related to the ability to unlock his dreams. Fred works as a business strategy consultant for First Nations Development Institution and the Regenerative Ag Foundation to build the Native American Fiber Program and Indian Hemp Economy. After attending the 2019 gathering, Fred knew he wanted to be a part of SEBA and is serving his first term on the board. So I'm really honored to present these three amazing people working in traditional fiber arts, um, native fiber arts, and also cutting edge um, pra fiber practices that really respond to today's world. And um, we're gonna go ahead and jump into the presentations and Louis is going to share a little bit about um, revitalizing traditional fiber arts of New Mexico and Hopi. Um, so I got to do introductions about y'all to everybody in the whole conference. So y'all are Indian famous now in fiber shed world. <laughs> um, so I wanna say uh, I reside in uh, Yelamu, um, which is also known as San Francisco. Um, I'm currently in the state of Oaxaca coming to you. Um, from there. I've spent a lot of time down here studying weaving, Zapotec weaving style, and um, I'm also a textile weaver, but um, I'm really, um, I just met Louis through this panel, and I'm really excited to learn more about um, his weaving style for Pueblo and Hopi people, and, um, and actually hopefully one day get to take a class with you, Louis. So um, Ian, we can go ahead and start Louis's presentation. Sure. How will Hino Mapuyuan, Nateham Torshan, Nitor Tainen. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is, uh, my Indian name is Sunrise in the Tiwa language, Torshan. And I'm from the Sun Clan. I am Tiwa and Piro from Southern New Mexico, born and raised here in Albuquerque. And I'm a traditional Pueblo fiber artist. I learned um, the basics of traditional weaving from my grandfather and um, explored the art and just had a true uh, interest and curiosity about it. So I would study um, the textiles and experiment with different structures. And um, now I, uh, I grow my own fiber and process my own fiber from cotton, um, grow my own cotton and, and food, of course, as Pueblo people were um, farmers traditionally. Um, next slide, please. So uh, first and foremost, and what's really important to understand about um, any culture really that um, you may be interested in learning more about is um, looking at the core values of um, of the people 
what's important to them. And invariably, you're going to find that place is uh, really uh, important in terms of how um, the people see themselves or see their place in their environment and, and in the world, ultimately. For us as Pueblo people, corn is um, at the center of our, of our life ways and um, everything that revolves around corn. So as agricultural people in an arid environment, we are solely dependent on um, the moisture that falls in um, the desert. And um, so much of our, our daily life and yearly activities are centered around um, agriculture and of course, um, the religious aspects and ceremonies, um, which are petitions for rain. And so as corn at the center of our life ways, um, we recognize and value um, hard work and um, dedication, um, me meaning that any work that we do um, is deliberate and, and has a purpose for the greater good of the community. So through prayers, um, ceremonies, songs, and dances, we recognize and um, show and put as well as petition for uh, moisture, which we believe are our ancestors um, that have gone to the spirit world and we believe that they return as rain clouds to bring moisture to the people. So meditation is um, a part of that and meditation can be as simple as uh, working in the field, tilling and weeding the field um, by hand. On the right here, we see um, a Hopi farmer, uh, probably just about the turn of the century um, tending a, a big open field and out at Hopi, they practice dry farming, uh, which is 100% uh, uh, just from precipitation from rainfall. So there's no uh, irrigation whatsoever out in the Hopi mesas. And the focus is always on the community. So the men go out, work in the fields um, and all of the, the, the produce from there is brought home to the family and then shared with the community. Next slide, please. So raw materials in terms of um, fiber arts and weaving, we have um, two eras, which are um, pre-contact, which include um, yucca fiber, which is a natural um, fiber that grows in the desert. It's a succulent. Um, from the Agavaceae family. Um, turkey feathers, um, turkeys are native to the um, Southwest and their feathers were a very important source of fiber um, that was used uh, prehistorically and turkeys and turkey feathers still are still a very important part of um, Pueblo um, culture, cultural practices and, and religion. Rabbit fur, was another fiber source, uh, white dog hair, human hair, and a fiber known as Indian hemp or uh, opossinum can cannabium, cannabinum. Cotton, which is from the mallow family, uh, was uh, an introduction from Mesoamerica right around 600, give or take a couple hundred years. Um, and then of course, after the arrival of the Spanish in the 1500s, we have the introduction of sheep um, and sheep's wool um, that was also adopted by um, Pueblo weavers. Next slide, please. So uh, what we know about ancestral Pueblo weaving is limited to a very um, small number of fragments that are left because of the perishable nature of the material. Being in a desert and in some cases, much of this material um, found its way into rat middens and, um, and or were stored in um, alcoves, um, in caves away from the elements. Um, so we do 
um, find some examples of sandal fragments, for example, or um, fragments of um, cotton textiles and yucca um, baskets and uh, sandals and whatnot. Um, very few of these are pristine textiles, but they, they do exist and they are out there in both um, public and private um, collections. But much of what we know about the, the um, uh, decoration style of early Pueblo textiles, we have discerned from Kiva murals or murals which um, were painted in the ceremonial chambers, in the Pueblo ceremonial chambers. So one particular um, village known as Pottery Mound, which is just west of Albuquerque, um, New Mexico, um, has uh, been documented by uh, archaeologists by the name of Charles Hibben. Um, and he documented several of these murals which depict many different styles of um, textiles which we see in the slide um, that are um, primarily asymmetrical in nature. Um, the, they make use of positive and negative space. And so the, all the designs are rich in meaning and often um, represent seeds, clouds, and rain. So um, all of these um, patterns and symbols are, are deliberate and very um, uh, represent the continuity, which we still um, can see in uh, various Pueblo art forms today, many um, similar designs and patterns. Next slide, please. So cotton, um, tahi in our Tiwa language. Um, the, the word cotton itself actually comes from Arabic, kutun. And here in this image, we see um, the connection or the, the similarity of um, cotton and clouds. And for us, cotton was a very important um, crop, which was cultivated by um, prehistorically by um, Pueblo groups in the Southwest. Um, and the, the likeness that it had to the clouds was very significant uh, for us as Pueblo people, because in essence, we believe that in working, in cultivating and working with this fiber, we're essentially um, working with the, with the rain clouds. And so the textiles, therefore the textiles that are woven from um, the fiber uh, are essentially rain clouds. So we use these textiles for our ceremonies, in our ceremonies um, to invoke um, rain and moisture. Um, the fact that in our oral history, we uh, acknowledge the origin of um, cotton as coming from Mesoamerica, which is a place with um, much more abundant moisture than we have here in the Southwest. Um, so we recognize um, that connection with the South and the migrations of people that were happening um, after, after uh, emergence. Um, next slide. So cotton, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, of the mallow family um, and it's a short staple. It has a very short um, fiber length. Uh, it is a cellulose fiber, meaning that it is a plant fiber. And it's the fiber itself is actually a seed fiber. Um, each fiber is a single cell. It's an elongated tube, if you will, um, that as it matures, flattens and twists on itself um, in both directions. And that uh, quality of the fiber is what allows it to be spun um, on, a, on a spindle. Um, cotton is, can, is grown in various colors, uh, especially in Mesoamerica, not so much in the Southwest, um, but particularly um, brown and green cotton are grown in Mesoamerica. 
and are and are now starting um, uh, can be grown here in the southwest as well. And it's probably one of the most um, versatile fibers that the world has has come to know. Um, definitely since um, the uh, commercialization of um, cotton, which now, of course, is a is a world fiber source. Um, next slide, please. So cotton has a very long history, over 5,000 years of cultivation in various parts of the world and various cultures. So again, the actual origin of the word we've come to know the fiber by in English, which is cotton, actually comes from Arabic, kutun. And um, cotton was thought of early, early in the history as um, little uh, vegetable wool, or you know, the, we see images in various texts of like little sheep suspended in trees. Um, but it's kind of uh, gives us the idea that people really had a no um, point of reference. Um, we know that cotton grows in natural colors including brown, um, purples, and greens. And current, it, it's, it's actually, um, cotton makes up our money. So um, our bills, our dollar bills are actually 75% cotton and 25% linen, um, not paper as, as some might think. Um, cotton fibers have also been used as filaments and light bulbs. It's a cholesterol-free cotton seed oil that can be used for cooking. In cotton itself, the fiber itself is very soft and hypoallergenic and absorb it. Next slide, please. So processing a fiber is a very social activity traditionally within Pueblo culture, and it was always done by the men. And um, weaving in Pueblo culture was um, exclusively um, a men's activity. Um, prior to uh, colonization, where children were taken to the boarding schools and um, the traditional um, um, Anglo or dominant society gender roles were imposed on the native students. And so the men uh, were taught to work on automobiles and, um, and do carpentry while the, all the, the little girls were um, taught needlework and weaving and knitting and crochet. Next slide. Some of the tools, we see lots of continuities in, in this tradition of over um, a thousand years. And with the exception of the cotton cards down at the bottom of the image, um, the rest of the tools have essentially remained unchanged for over a thousand years. At the very top, there's a, a weaving batten which is used to um, fell the cloth as it's uh, uh, being woven. There's a traditional spindle uh, with the spindle whirl where um, cotton can be spun. There are awls um, used to uh, manipulate the, the warps and weft as the weaving is being woven and combs that are used to um, beat down the uh, weft. And then the smaller finishing needles and uh, finishing battens used to um, close in the weaving as uh, the, the traditional textiles are not cut off the loom. They're actually uh, woven with four natural selvages and the weaving is closed in, in, the, in somewhere in the middle of the, of the web itself. Next slide. So with the introduction of wool in the 1500s, we, we see um, the, uh, the adoption of um, the protein fiber of wool um, by um, the Pueblo weavers. Next slide. Uh, where wool is a protein fiber and has a very long staple. Um, the, the original breed of sheep that was introduced by the Spanish had, had much less uh, lanolin grease in it. Uh, in comparison to say Merino, which uh, is a popular um, a desirable uh, wool fiber today. Uh, wool has um, certain qualities that cotton does not. It's much more insulating. 
um, even when wet or moist. And uh, as a protein fiber, it accepts dye much more easily. But despite these qualities, it never uh, replaced cotton, again, because of the association with um, clouds. But it was, it's, wool still um, became an uh, uh, important uh, fiber source for um, the Pueblo weavers. Next slide. So as, as uh, weavers, um, we see just like when we're planting our fields and growing a crop, whether it be corn, squash, beans, chili, or cotton, uh, we see that um, the textiles themselves, as well as the plants that we grow, are, are our children. We sing to them. Oftentimes when we're sitting at our loom weaving, we'll sing songs. These songs are, are usually uh, petitions for rain, uh, reminding us uh, how we should live um, life and remain true to our, our religion and our spiritual um, responsibilities as taking part in um, community ceremonies for the uh, greater good. And um, just like our, my two girls here on, in the picture, all of the textiles that I weave are also my children. So as, as I'm weaving, I'm praying. And as the textiles completed, then those prayers will then bestow upon the wearer when they uh, are wearing the textiles for use in ceremony. Um, so ultimately everything comes full circle. And as we complete that, that cycle, um, there comes a point at times when the textile is laid to rest with an individual or can be passed down, um, but the, con the prayers continue um, to accompany that and fulfill as the textile fulfills its purpose. So thank you very much. That's a um, short introduction of um, Pueblo weaving and Pueblo fiber arts. That's really beautiful, Louis, thank you. Um, I, I think continually through indigenous fiber arts, there is a um, there is a connection to spirituality and what that um, how that is expressed through the practices of weaving. And what I also what, when I first um, heard you say that spinning is a communal practice, is a is a family practice, is something that people did together. I think that's also really beautiful. And I know that there's a lot of spinners. That, and weavers too here um, with us today. And sometimes that can feel like lonely work. Mm -hmm. And to get back to community, I think is um, really powerful. And indigenous practice has that within our fiber practices is um, the community, the spirituality, the connection to the planet and how we're all integrated. So we'll have some time to address uh, Louis' presentation specifically at the end. And um, we will go ahead and jump into Alice's presentation. So Ian, we can pull that up. Thank you so much, Lou. That was beautiful. Ayuki, hello. This is Alice Lincoln Cook. I am a Karuk tribal member, and I'm the current chairwoman for the California Indian Basket Weavers Association. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about following the smoke, the original following the smoke, as well as following the smoke too, which um, we have taken on to um, rebuild the program. Um, before I talk about following the smoke, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I got involved um, with um, weaving and um, where it has led me to in terms of um, following the smoke too. So um, 16, 17 years ago, I started out as a vendor selling my, um, our jewelry, our family's jewelry at um, the SIVA's annual events. And I continued to do that for many years. Um, and then I started teaching. Um, I became a teacher at the event. Um, I watched, I learned, I enjoyed it. I began teaching throughout um, the state of California, throughout the state of Oregon, and then um, some basket weaving events in Nevada as well as Washington. Um, it became a passion for me. I really enjoy it. Um, and um, uh, it just, it, it did something to me that I, 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 I really wanted to be a big part of it. So I did join um, SIVA four years ago. Um, 
And within a year of being on the SEBA board, I was asked to um, revitalize the Following the Smoke too, bring that program back. Um, the program started in 2007 and um, it ended, um, ended 2012, I believe. And um, within that time period, um, a, a, a time has passed and um, we just felt it was a really strong program to bring back up. So I work with Ken Wilson, Renee and Deanna, who was all part of the Following the Smoke, as well as many other basket weavers um, to rebuild the program, to start over. Uh, we started out by having a symposium and um, inviting a lot of, of, of different agencies, different um, basket weaving groups, um, anybody that we thought would be beneficial um, that would support or help us with these, um, these places that we go to, the weaving and what the weavers, um, what the weavers needs were. Um, so we had our symposium and then we had our gathering um, at Camp Creek in Orleans. And it was amazing. We had a wonderful time. It was, um, um, it was started in the same place where they started it in the very beginning. So we felt like it was honoring her or honoring them to have it in the exact same place it was many, many years ago. Um, and so it turned out to be a great event and we really enjoyed it, but, um, this year we had a, um, was going to do another following the smoke and we were unable to do the COVID. So um, we are moving on to other programs within that. So that's just kind of how I started with SEBA and how I joined in and how I've, um, you know, been able to stumble up on following the smoke and be a part of that program. Um, so that I really enjoy and I'm grateful that um, I was able to be a part of it and still supporting and be a part of the group. Um, so we're going to move on to um, the vision for following the smoke too. The vision for following the smoke too. The program is to support, perpetuate, and enhance American Indian traditional basket weaving at a local level, developing partnerships between government agencies and tribes. Uh, next, please. You'll notice in a lot of these pictures that we have, we'll have baskets on there, we'll have people weaving. Um, some of these pictures are from previous, um, I mean, um, old, old following the smoke events, and some are from the current ones, but all of them have materials and, and kind of showing you what happens at a lot of these events. Um, some of the goals of the programs are to provide an opportunity for basket weaving skill sharing, um, empower weavers to become advocates to their own gathering sites, enhance knowledge of access to traditional gathering sites and improve public agency personnel knowledge of traditional practices and cultural properties. Next, please. Um, so a little bit of the history, and as I mentioned before, um, I guess I got the dates wrong. So uh, the original um, following, the smoke, following the Smoke started out in 1997 and ended about 2009. And again, that started in Orleans at Camp Creek. And um, the picture that's shown is of Laverna Reese and Ken Wilson. And they were, again, a huge part of the following the smoke um, when it started. This is a recent picture of them when they were at the camp this year, or this last year. So um, both were wonderful to work with. Um, Verna is an amazing weaver, an amazing person, and Ken has been a huge support for weavers, for SEBA, um, and for following the smoke. Um, for the following the smoke history, it was an award, uh, award winning US Forest Service Passport and Time program. And a lot of their participants um, included basket weavers, multi agency employees, and educators from all over. Next, please. So this picture has a lot of our baskets on the side um, and um, the beautiful basket with a bunch of different materials, but a little bit of our history is um, the intent of our original project was for volunteers to appreciate the values of traditional basket weaving and support agencies in uh, managing for ethnobotanical resources. Um, so some of the, uh, with this history and, um, and the things that we're doing to support and to manage 
um, we've had a lot of challenges um, in our history as, as time has gone on and climate change has played a huge role in that. Um, we can um, plan things, but it really depends on what our, what our year was like, whether we had too much snow, whether we had too much rain, um, whether we didn't get enough. Um, all that depends on how and when our materials grow. Um, we have a normal period where our materials grow. Let's say we go May, June, we gather a certain material. Sometimes it's later because our freeze was too long. Um, sometimes um, there, we had too much rain and it didn't, uh, it's not ready yet. So there are, you know, climate change plays a huge role in what we can and can't do. And it's usually every year um, to see what we, um, to see what, how we have to work it the following year. And once we get, we figure it out, we're able to move forward with it and, and keep going at a normal rate, but we do have to figure it out. And fortunately we have some weavers that are um, going out and checking it every week to see whether this is, you know, this spot is going to be good or whether it's good um, in that area where I come from a, a, a a long ways away to go back and gather so I don't have the opportunity to go check all the time so that plays a hardship in in what we can do too so if we don't have access to it on a daily basis we're not able to um, go check it and see if it's it's ready um, next please so the importance of basket weaving and the involvement is multi-generational approach um, weaving for balance and wellness. It honors the spirit and the spirituality and connects to the past and the present family and community. And you can see um, there's an elder with the youth, which is one of my favorite pictures because um, I love to see the youth at any of our basket weaving. Um, um, I definitely have my niece teach um, bear grass braiding at some of our events and um, even though she's very, very young in teaching, people come to her more than they would come to me because they'd like to learn from her. So um, I, 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 really, um, I really promote the youth in, in, in weaving and what we need to do. So I think it's really important. Next, please. This picture is of Laverne Glaze and her daughter, Renee. Um, Laverne, again, um, she originally started the program. She was the one, she was the lead for the program. Um, Laverne is no longer with us. Yo Chua Laverne for um, bringing this program to us. Um, she has just been a huge inspiration and uh, fortunately she left a lot of memories and a lot of um, guidance with her kids, um, Renee and um, Deanna to be able to um, help us. Um, promote and guide this program the right way. Um, one of my fondest memories with Renee, or with Laverne and Renee, um, and several other weavers, I think there was about eight of us, and we got into an elevator, and um, somebody said something, there was at least five of the weavers with their legs crossed because they couldn't move and we were laughing so hard we couldn't get off the elevator, nobody could come on the elevator, and um, uh, that was, you know, that was my last memory of Laverne, and it was a good memory, and those are the things that I look forward to. Um, every time we have a weaving event, there's something that happens there that is amazing, and it's an amazing feeling to sit and weave and laugh and talk and listen to stories of other weavers. So um, that was, you know, that was definitely something that I've always enjoyed, and um, there's no feeling like that. There's, there, it, I don't have that feeling anywhere else. So um, that inspired me and I really enjoyed it. And I hope to promote that same type of feeling that people, when they come to our events, that's what they see and that's what they enjoy. Um, next, please. This picture is one of the following the smokes. Um, I'm not sure the exact year of it, but you can see there's materials on the table, there's baskets on the table. Um, most of the ladies are wearing their basket caps, um, which are all made of the materials. Um, there were several tables around like this that showed um, special um, gathering materials, how they were processed. They had demonstrators there making baskets, um, teaching, processing. Um, it was just a, it, 
they're wonderful events to go to and to learn. Um, next, please. This picture is of following the smoke. This was our following smoke um, um, symposium that we put on um, where we, um, I'd mentioned it earlier, um, we gathered um, a, bunch, a bunch of different people came together and we were able to talk and to um, figure out ways to promote this program and, and support the program. And it was, it was a great outcome. We, um, there were some wonderful ideas. Um, it, it, was, it, was a really, it was a really good start to have a symposium and open it up to many, many people and many people's ideas and how we could promote and make this a, a really good solid program to promote everywhere. Um, next, please. This one is also the following the smoke too. Um, this is Ken Wilson and Deborah McConnell. Um, both of them, I mentioned Ken before, both of these have played a huge role in the following the smoke in the past. Um, Deborah is a phenomenal weaver and Ken is this amazing supporter to any basket weaver um, and is a huge fan of, um, of, of weaving and promoting weaving and helping basket weavers in any way that he can. Um, so with this planning meeting, um, we were just, we, we just gained so much out of it to promote and support traditional Indian basket weaving throughout the Northwest of California. Next please. This one highlights a lot of our partners that we had for 2000 and um, for this last year um, uh, for following the smoke too. So we have the California Indian Basket Weavers Association, um, the California, I mean the Karuk Basket Weavers, Yurok Basket Weavers, Trinidad Rancheria, Bureau of Land Management, Arcata Office, Six Rivers National Forest, Ken Wilson, CRM Consulting, um, California State Parks, Redwood National Park and California Department of Transportation. Um, these guys have played a huge role and they were a huge support for us um, with following the smoke. Um, it could not have happened without them. Um, the, the support that they gave us, whether they were driving, whether they were bringing, um, um, bringing material, you know, helping us take us out to where we could gather materials, whether they were bringing food, water, they were helping in any way that they could. They were also um, set up stands. And so they gave out information about, um, let's say they gave out information about California State Parks, where you could get a permit, how you could get a permit. Um, they had maps out of different locations. Um, each one of them came with great information and all of them were a huge support for the weavers. And um, yeah, I, I think they, they helped us vastly and I appreciate all the partners that we've had. Next, please. This picture is of my nephew and me at Following the Smoke. Um, you can see he has a, um, an eel basket that he was weaving and demonstrating at the event. Um, so, on the following the smoke, we want to extend programs to other tribes throughout Northwest California. Ideally, I would love to be able to reach out beyond California to go to Oregon, you know, Washington, Idaho. Um, I would like um, basket weaving uh, groups everywhere be able to have what we have with this program and promote it everywhere to have the same sort of support that we have. Um, I think it's really, really important. So with this following the smoke too, we are going to have three um, annual programs. So we chose three to um, be able to gather three different times a year. So that's kind of, we, sometimes we gather more than that, um, but there, our gathering is pretty seasonal. So there's not one month where we can gather at all. It's pretty spread out. Um, so we did the three different ones a year to help be able to gather certain, you know, whether we can gather three materials in June, we can take them out and gather three materials in June for one of these events. And we also help, hope to have it everywhere. We don't, we're not just, we don't just want to have it in one particular place. We hope to make these three annual events different places throughout the state of California so that everybody's seeing um, how the program runs. Next, please. 
This one again is of our um, following the smoke two in Camp Creek um, in May 2019. And both of these ladies are SEBA board members. One is Deanna, and um, that's Laverne Glaze's daughter as well. And the other one is Jennifer Malone, who is a uh, SEBA board member of uh, a long time SEPA board member and she was uh, traveled a long long distance to come to following the smoke and um, um, help us um, help us um, help us with the whole entire pro progress as well as gain some knowledge of the things that she does um, next please This is also, um, this is our event that we were supposed to have this year. So it was the Kruk um, Tribal Gathering, Basket Weaver Gathering, and Following the Smoke too. So we have scheduled to have this event, and unfortunately, due to COVID, we weren't able to have it. Um, so we're looking forward to doing it again next year and having more planning preparation. And um, hopefully it'll go really well. So we're looking forward to another event. Um, in the meantime, we are having to stick with virtual programs, um, and we have developed a, a program that is for following the smoke, and we decided that we would like to um, highlight our agencies, um, the people that have been partnering with us and helping us with all these um, events that we have. Um, we do at these events, we do thank them. We appreciate them for being there, but I really wanted to highlight just them in our videos and um, let everybody know what they did for us as well as utilize the video for their, their personal uses on, um, in their district or, or, or their place. So um, we will be developing six videos and they will be shared on social media. And hopefully that'll broaden the outreach um, across the state. So look forward to seeing, seeing those and um, checking out those. Next, please. So this is just a picture of a basket, a phenomenal basket. Um, but it can, I, it, again, I can um, tell you a little bit about um, the importance of um, some of the materials that we have. So in explaining what the following the smoke name came from, um, it came from Basque weavers needing a burn um, for stronger materials. So burning and then following the smoke by going there the next year, that's where that name originated from. Um, so one of the materials that we like to burn that makes it a little bit stronger, makes it durable, pliable, is bear grass, which is shown in this picture. It is also the off-white in the basket. Um, so when we do have it burned, it's stronger to work with. And you could see the tight work on the basket. So if you're pulling on it and it breaks and it breaks and it breaks, it makes it harder to achieve a very, really nice basket. So with that burning um, preparation and going through the burning process and then gathering the next year, that will enhance the bare grass and make the weaving a little bit easier. There's nothing easy about this basket, but make it a little bit easier in the process. So next, please. This one um, has some hazel sticks, which is another uh, material that we prefer to be burned. Um, and um, that is the sticks laying behind the basket. So hazel sticks are used in many different baskets. Um, one of the ones that um, I like to use all the time is a baby basket. So when we have the sticks burned, um, they come back much stronger and, um, and more pliable, easier to work with. They come back longer. Um, it's just very, very healthy when they come back after a burn. And um, a stronger basket to hold the baby is pretty important. And so um, with those materials processed that way, um, it, it's good for the baby, good for the basket. Next, please. So um, thank you for um, listening today. If you have any questions, please reach out to the California Indian Basket Weavers Association. Let us know if there's any way that we can help you or if you're having any issues that we can um, provide some information. Yo Chua, thank you. That was a beautiful presentation of following the smoke. The 
the program that um, Alice and Siba have started that was amazing. And someone had asked, what is the, what is the meaning of the name? And um, that was quite different than, than I thought, but of course, Native Born Practices to bring back um, and revitalize traditional uh, materials. So I know there's a lot of really exciting questions in the Q&A, and I want to um, let you know that I'm acknowledging those, and I've seen Louis answer some of them by type. And then there's a few that are floating around in the other chat window. And we'll try our best to get um, to those questions at the end. And I just want to also to um, be respectful of time and that um, Fred still has some really amazing stuff to share with us as well. So please type your questions in the chat and we'll try to get to them at the end. And I do see them and some of them are getting, are getting answered. And we're gonna go ahead and jump into Fred's presentation because um, I know we're already running behind time. So thank you and thanks, Alice, that was beautiful. And we'll come back around with all of the stuff at the end. We can go ahead and start Fred's presentation. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. It's an honor to present here. I know Rebecca was into fine fiber and wine. And uh, behind me is a few carboys of wine that I made this year. So I, I brought wine here to the party for everyone. And hopefully one day everyone uh, can have a taste. But I, I felt it was appropriate for being in Marin County, uh, Lake County, Sonoma County, which I'm going to talk about here real soon and, and share some stories about my family and our pomo basketry and some of our ways in our basketry so I know how people collectors look at baskets and view it as art and see such beautiful designs in such ways but to us pomo people that our basketry really comes down to individuality spirituality mental healing, spiritual healing, and there's ways to achieve that. And I learned going through a, an educational system where there's equations, the ways to explain it, to achieve our spirituality through our basketry, which I wanna share with you and, and, and mention that a lot of these ways here that I, I share with you, they're not found in any books. And how I learned it is through my grandmother, who I'll explain later, we have a, a lineage from Mabel McKay, which is actually one of the most famous pomo basket weavers of them all. But my grandmother, who was the tribal treasurer for 17 years, I lived with her on the reservation. And then she showed me, taught me about business, politics and basket weaving and how to achieve your dream and your basket weaving. So I just wanna go here, circle to, and focus on the picture before me, which is my sedge gathering area. And it's very, very beautiful in that area, but you can see it's waist deep of dry sedge roots or sedge leaves there, I'll just say, which is a major fire hazard. In the old Pomo ways, we used to be able to burn those sedge and then the ash would go into the ground and we would dig up the roots and then we would replant bulbs and then the soil and the ash and the connection while our hands or our knees are on the ground, our hands are in the soil, we listen to Mother Earth and she gives us guidance and she tells us and we could feel her. In Pomo ways, it's all about feel, but we lost a lot of that connection. You can see we can't burn that. And it becomes even more of a fire hazard when I go and cut it and make a huge pile. And like I said, an, a fire hazard. So we really wish we could practice our traditional way to help mitigate climate change. And so today, like I said, I, I, the big takeaway in our Pomo way, I really hope to share the insight of our basket weaving to heal and how to achieve that way, how to heal. So uh, next slide, please. So I am the program director for the Native American Fiber Program under the Regenerative Agriculture Foundation. And this program here, I'll say when I first started this program, I was, I, I had the dream when I was 17 years old 
to fly across the continent to be into chemical engineering, into business investments, which I am now helping tribal communities. And the way I saw this program was through my baskets and through a teacher, Louie, my teacher. When I first started the Native American fiber program, it was from the needs of the community, the people. What did the people want? So the people wanted fiber, hemp fiber, the tribes in the upper Midwest, especially now with jobs, COVID, they need new jobs. So the tribal hemp economy and the fiber is what we're really focusing on. And from, coming from California, we have to remember, it, it, it takes a little education that in California, we have primarily marijuana, which is illegal, but then hemp fiber is federally legal. So uh, lots of tribes are really focusing on that. And the thought there, how that started is from my teacher, Louie. I remember Louie when he was weaving, I took his class in New Mexico and he was helping me weave my belt. And while he was showing me how to weave, he reminded me of the indigenous practice. And he said, Fred, Fred, you're on a path that's very, unknown. So look in the stars and that's where you'll find your answers. So as I flew across the continent from California to Wisconsin to California to Minnesota from California to Dakotas, I felt that feeling. I saw it in the stars, the animal. It was the goose. It was the bird that helped me see other tribes of their animal shapes also. A buffalo, a salmon, a crow, and Louie, a water snake. So when I looked at, had that indigenous lens, it helped me put things together. And I'll tell you that one of the work that we're doing now with the tribes is we have a research proposal to begin making hemp auto parts on Indian communities. So that indigenous knowledge, that search of how to search those ways, it started with Louis, my teacher. So we're supporting tribes. So please pray for us on November 17th, our research proposal, which has already support from Ford, Hyundai, um, Ford, Hyundai and John Deere, 3M, to begin manufacturing fiber base, hemp base auto parts, because right now they're 100%. So our research will then get plastic down from 100% to 80% plastic, 20% natural fiber, 50% plastic, 50% natural fiber, and hopefully 80% natural fiber and 20% plastic hemp auto parts and started jobs in tribal communities. So that's one of the wings of our Native American fiber program. And our conservative wing, our right wing was here in California where we, the need was access to land for harvesters for gathering roots for our basket weavers. So the Native American fiber program, like I said, I had the stream of always helping my Indian people. So my program is a stewardship program, which I hope to grow bigger in, over time. So, but I saw, like I said, I saw this in my basket when I was 17. So next uh, slide, please. <laughs> so my, so here's my lineage from Mabel McKay. And I wanna explain how we're related and in a poem way, we tell a story, we kind of have to break it down and build it up. That's just how the way we do it. So I want to start at the map here and say Big Valley Rancheria, where I'm a rural tribal member, is my grand from my grandmother, Priscilla Valente, whose mother was 
Virginia Martin, who was however related to Mabel, Mabel's mother was Pearlie. Pearlie and my grandmother, great grandmother, Virginia, were sisters. Mabel had a sister named Mona who taught my grandmother, Priscilla, how to make baskets. And my grandma, Lulu, Priscilla, from Big Valley Rancheria, taught me, showed me, told me about basket weaving and the healing I'm about to tell you. But I want to show you our traditional land here predominantly, you know, Marin County, Sonoma County, Lake County, which is Pomo, Wapo, and Miwok lands. And my, my family traveled all of these lands here and our tradition, another part of our traditional land where my grandmother, great grandmother Virginia came from was Marshall. So if you see Marshall, who's ever from there, there's a little cemetery across from the bay there, across the street on the left-hand side, there's a cemetery. That's our family cemetery and you'll see Elgin. So my family has always traveled across these lands here, harvesting, um, gathering, collecting roots. And this has always been traditionally Pomo lands here. So, um, and that's our, I wanted to explain my lineage, basket lineage to Mabel. So next slide, please. Okay. So some of the, the ways how Pomos, we viewed our baskets and the perspective I wanna to give to the audience is our baskets was a sign of wealth. We had a system of money. Now, if you look at this basket here and you see the round circular shells, that was our Pomo money. And you could see the basket was one of our most prized possessions and how it's displayed on baskets. So that tells you there how our baskets, how valuable they were. 300 years ago, those baskets created lots of yield, wealth, when they were stolen and taken to Europe and put in collections. These baskets here were very, very prized. It was the most prized possession for Pomos. And I wanna say we Pomos are considered some of the best basket weavers. And we are some of the only basket weavers to use feathers in our baskets. Next slide, please. I don't want to get too emotional. I'm sorry about how of, 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 of the, the trauma and the history of how our, our lands and the wealth, the connection to land and wealth and the shift of wealth in the land, how my family comes from some of the most wealthiest lands in California. How, and we tell the stories and we have the maps to prove it. However, we don't have it wealth has shifted. Wealth came from land and our baskets, as you can see, but now it's not. So the stories that they say, and we know that a lot of our lands were stolen from gunpoint. Gunpoint. My grandfather had from Big Valley had to go down to Marshall to pick up my grandmother during the early, late 1800s because they were massacring people down there. That's how my grandmother came to, from Marshall to Big Valley. And so the way we tell a story that the cemetery, the people who live above the cemetery, those are the ones who chased us out with guns. So there's lots of hurt feelings and the shift of wealth and loss and how much was lost and stolen, but not taught in the school history books because our perspective has never been allowed to speak until now we are allowed to speak. So then ways how to go about in the world 
to fulfill yourself without being, I want to say, too crazy, but being able to just live, flow, just like water, being able to adapt. We saw that in basket weaving and the healing, the healing that it took, that my grandma told me. My grandma was the treasurer for 17 years. That was a lot of pressure to bring in the casino, the the hotel, marina, RV park, everything. But then to put it together, how she said, was basket weaving. And there's a secret of healing, which I'll show you here in front of us. It's Indian rule number four. It's almost like an equation of how to go about your life, how to find spirit. So I'll go through it here. Indian rule number one. In Pomo ways, it's, it's all by feel. How do we feel? And we have to feel comfortable in your own skin. So my eyes are brown, my face is brown, my skin is brown, just like chocolate. And over time, I develop buckskin. To Indian rule number two, again, all by feel. How do you feel? You begin to like things like basket weaving, hunting, fishing, grant making. And then you see parallels, which make you happy. You're able to go out and replicate those things through works, through basket weaving, whatever that you do at your home. Indian rule number three, again, all by feel. Now those, that feeling inside that you have of that goodness of whatever it is, it begins to match with other people. And then the force becomes even greater. It becomes very connecting. That's how you develop relationships with human beings over time. We just, that happiness, like, hey, I just really love the things that you're doing. Let's get together. This is wonderful. It's great. Let's keep doing it. And once you start feeling that inside, hold it, lock it. That's it right there. And then that's where it becomes supernatural. But then to understand that, you have to leave the body. You have to leave the body. And that's what we all do in the end. That's Indian rule number four. And once you become spirit, you feel that you've left your body, then you're able to channel other spirits. So for example, I always ask my grandma, who is the treasurer for 17 years, when I go into business meetings, grandma, grandma, please always be with me. And she is, she gives me good guidance. And also Jesus, of course, like they say in our, our Pomo ways that leadership comes from water. And I know one person that has turned water into wine. So I follow those ways and I ask them always, channel spirits to be with me. So those ways you could find in your basket and those ways were taught to me by my grandmother. So I really hope it helps you how to heal and gives you a lot of answers to your questions that you have. But I just wanna say that the Indian rule number four, it's like, it is an equation and it goes and it works different ways with every situation in the world. So I've learned it here, how to heal, but I also learned it, how, how to use the equation to make my dream come true in my basket. And I'll show you, and I'll explain to that later as I go on. So um, I hope that helped there for some of you at home to understand so uh, how to heal and achieve spirit. So uh, next slide, please. So here's my basket and some of the materials. And you can see some of the basket bottoms there that I used, the abalone, and that was our medicine. And the, it really is important, the shape of your basket, because the shape of your basket determines your, your energy. So for example, if you have a very big basket, you're probably gonna wanna pack a lot of things, maybe acorns or fish or something in that basket. It's a big basket, so you better have a lot of energy. 
my baskets, they're very small baskets. It's because the way I see the world where I come up with all these ideas and hey, sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not, but then, hey, I gotta come up with another idea. I come up with so many different ideas and that's how my baskets, and I was able to see a lot of the things that I want, such as parallels of being basket weavers and be able to say, hey, I see this here in the future and how to make that come true into that future it takes a lot of thought, which our ancestors already gave in the equation. So, which I will explain in the next slide, but I just wanna show everyone, those are the materials that I use. That's the sedge root that I use. And to make a basket in the back, it takes a very, very long time to collect materials over 30 hours. I typically do not sell my baskets because in the Pomo way, you give the basket as a sign of love. So here, that basket in the back, I have not seen the owner yet because of the pandemic, but that basket there's, his name is Winrose. And Winrose, he's he's just like me. Like I said, I, I, I'm, I have the skin color of chocolate and he has a skin color of white chocolate, but together in a bag, oh, we are a bag of chocolate. We work, we're great. And the way we see everything together is here. I give him my basket as a sign of my love for his ways. So next slide, please. So here, Indian rule number four used in Fred's basket. So my basket, I need to move my thing here. It's always good thoughts, good prayers, good feelings to help me heal, to help me move on and to always see, have a dream, to have hope, to be able to think of a future that is good and it's positive for all our Indian people. So I wanna share my, my formula, my equation, that I use to make all my baskets. So Indian rule number one, first you have to have the desire, like you want to be a basket weaver. You wanna do this, I like this, I'm committed. And Indian rule number two, you have to have the definition. Like you have to be able to determine the pattern, what your basket's gonna look like, how the shape will come. You have to be able to see that in your basket. Indian rule number three, determination. Once you start your basket and then you get about halfway, it becomes, oh, do I really wanna do this anymore? Lots give up and they don't wanna do this anymore. So you have to have it, determination. And then Indian rule number four, you finished your basket. You can't just fall in love with just one. You have to go on to the next and the next and the next. You have to be able to give up, give it up, detach and go on and create a new basket. And this is when my grandma said that when you finish your basket, you can look at the bottom and your dream, it will be able to come true. Like I said, to start the Native American fiber program, that was my dream. I saw that a long time ago. And I hope to continue and make more dreams and new dreams. And the, the ability that I was able to make that happen was all through my basket. When I was weaving my basket, I prayed for good thoughts and good things to come. So next, next slide, please. So uh, there's one thing I wanna share with everyone at home that I know that you've never heard this one. This is new news to me too, that when I lived in Hawaii and I met, I lived on the island of Lanai and I met some Hawaiian people there where that they showed me a picture of the petroglyph on the left. 
they could not explain that picture. When I saw that, I said, wait a minute, that is a big head dancer, as you see in the picture on the right. So there's our, our dancer there. And we have a story on the right. If you could see the, the dancer, the big head dancer that looks just like the, like similar to the petroglyph, that the skirt that he's using, a man from Hawaii came long time ago and gave us that skirt. But the people in my tribe at Big Valley Rancheria and the people in Hawaii, you know, they, ne they haven't met. It's something that they haven't even, a story that's not even told because I wanna say colonialism. I know that Hawaii Hawaiians, even Pomos could travel across the ocean if they followed the humpback whale just like how I follow the goose. So I know they could do that. So I'd really like one day to have some people from Lanai, Hawaii to come to our dances and see our dances and some of my tribal members at the Big Valley Rancheria to go to the petroglyph and see the, and, and feel, how do they feel around that area? Will the earth, the spirits talk to them? I'm sure they will. But throughout my travels and my life that I share with you here, I, I wanted to share this untold story of fiber, which the Native American Fiber Program would love to research and explore and have lots of people, more people involved in this untold story. So that's all I have today. I think that's all my time. So thank you. Thanks, Fred. That was really beautiful. And thanks for sharing. Um, those, the stories and the spiritual connection to basketry and the reminders of what it takes to be a basket maker. So um, we only have a few minutes for Q&A and I know that there's a lot of exciting, exciting questions out there. So um, your, some of your questions might not get answered live here, but I know that Louie addressed a lot of them. I'm gonna start with one that um, will apply to all of you. And the question was, um, I'd be interested in what materials you're using for your baskets and if, they're, if, if you are doing any management of those plants in the natural environment and how that interacts with the natural ecosystem. And anyone can jump in and take that if they feel inspired to answer. What was the question one more time? I'm sorry. Okay. I would be interested in what materials you're using for your baskets and if doing any management of those plants in the natural environment and if you are doing any natural environment management and how that interacts with the natural ecosystem. So what kind of materials are you using and have you done any um, management of those materials? Well, I'm using sedge root and I typically um, harvest in November, December, and the traditional way was to burn and allow the ash then to go on the ground. And then you dig up the roots and then you cut the bulbs and then replant. And the ash and the soil then mix together. The bulb then grows and the root absorbs the soil or the carbon in the soil and that was you know the natural cycle and that's the what i tried to do however burning is an issue especially now i wish we could burn more but there it's really restricted now when i was growing up we could burn any time it didn't matter but now they don't allow it as we all can see yeah, it's a, it's a whole different world with climate change now. And I know that um, that following the smoke also has the same practices of burning and, and um, cultivating materials. And I just want to also notice that Robin Mitchell 
Um, there are several agencies interested in working with indigenous people to revive their traditional burn, burn practices. And um, Robin, that's amazing. And um, we'll connect with you afterwards because I'm sure all of our all of our tribes would love to um, start connecting with more agencies that can help facilitate that. And um, I, let's see, there's another question here that I was, um, so Louis, there was a couple questions about cotton and um, how you grow, dry, grow cotton in a dry environment. Can you give us a little synopsis of what you're doing over there in Albuquerque? Yes, um, the cotton that's grown, that I grow is uh, heritage, um, heritage cotton, which means that it's been cultivated in the Southwest for over 500 years. So it's um, been well adapted to um, the desert environment that we live in and uh, dry farming practices. So um, whenever I tell people that I'm growing cotton, they always say, oh, wow, it must use a lot of water. And uh, actually it doesn't, uh, it's, it's actually, um, there's a reason why cotton is uh, one of the world's largest cash crops because it is probably one of the most um, productive uh, plant fibers um, that exist. And um, lots of um, people got really rich off of cotton. Um, you know, in the in the early years of of um, the United States, but uh, indigenous people, such as the Pueblo people of the Southwest, and um, other groups in Mesoamerica, have been cultivating cotton for um, generations before that, before um, colonization. And so, uh, we still maintain um, those practices, and there are not very many. Pueblo uh, folks that are um, cultivating cotton, if they are, it's in small, like on a small, very small scale, um, and mostly for uh, religious use, um, because we still um, use cotton as part of our, our um, offerings and our prayers, especially during uh, the winter months when uh, the earth is renewing, renewing herself, and we're making um, prayers for the uh, renewal. Thanks, so Louis, seeds, um, seeds, seeds. Um, I'm gonna, Louis, I'm gonna jump in real quick and have um, Alice answer a question because we only have about four more minutes. And I know that this can go on forever and you guys have such a wealth of knowledge. Um, but Alice, can you tell us a little bit about how landowners and farmers can help support California Indian basket weavers? Um, so, um, private agencies, I spoke, I spoke to about private agencies quite a bit, um, and their support that they've given us, not only to, um, access to their land, um, but helping us in any way to access it, giving us permits, any of that, all those things are really difficult tasks to go through. Um, and a lot of the partnerships we've had already with following the smoke, they've opened that up and, and. You know, they know where everything is in their land and they're able to tell us, you know, the exact spots where we could go out and pick. So a lot of times when our weavers are looking for an area, I'll tell them, go to the ranger district, go to the BLM office, whatever's closest to that area. And then um, they will give you maps. They will help you out to pick in those areas. So, you know, opening up the land and, and helping us find what we need on, those, on the land is, is pretty vital to me. Yeah, thanks, Alice, for that, because um, a lot of the California Indian tribes are not federally recognized, don't have land, are not land owners, and I know really big right now is land back, you know, um, but that's real for California people, California Native people, if we don't have access to land, then we can't gather and practice our traditional, our traditional textile practices. Um, here is one that's just a general question, and feel free for anybody to jump in, but the question is from Bailey Rose. How can non-Indigenous American designers utilize local native made fibers in their designs and honor the Indigenous cultures without appropriating or taking away resources from Indigenous people? It's kind of a big one. So for, for me, I'll go for us and our, our um, materials. Everything is, is, like I said, a certain time of year you have to go out and pick. 
Um, you can't buy any of our materials anywhere. So getting access to it is a little bit difficult. And so that, that plays a huge role. It's not that we don't give people an opportunity to come out and make things at like our gatherings and stuff like that, or that we don't put on um, little virtual things in different areas. We do do that, but to come out and pick materials um, would be pretty hard to do. I mean, there's permits and people can do it. There's no stopping um, people from doing it, but um, normally we have our, you know, our permits, we go out and we gather on them, so. Yeah, and that's for basketry materials. Um, Louis, how about y'all over there um, cultivating cotton and wool? How can um, non-Indigenous American designers support local native fibers and people who are producing or, um, or growing or spinning fiber in your area? Um, that's a good question. Like uh, I mentioned earlier, um, there's not a lot of us um, Pueblo folks um, cultivating cotton and if 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 we are if there are it's um, definitely not for um, commercial uses or for sale well, we're um, producing our own cotton for ceremonial use within our communities and um, but there are lots of um, non-native folks who um, choose to cultivate cotton even in uh, in uh, planting pots, um, you know, in a small, very small scale, uh, mostly just out of curiosity, people, um, you know, we're so far removed from our fiber these days that, um, you know, many, most, a lot of people don't even have any concept or point of reference for what a cotton plant looks like or what cotton, how cotton grows. Um, so a lot of it is that there are lots of hand spinners um, who can uh, purchase um, cotton uh, sliver um, that's prepared uh, specially for um, hand spinners um, that can, you know, uh, have access to it. Um, there's a place out of Arizona called Cotton Clouds that sells um, different, different types of cotton uh, preparations um, and cotton yarns um, that is uh, locally sourced and organic so that would be a good Great. source it's a good start great well um we're gonna have to wrap it up there there's so many great questions thank you thank you louis for addressing those in the chat and thanks thanks to fred and louis and alice today for sharing their knowledge with us and um i know a couple of us got choked up because you know our our traditional practices is, are so so deep and there's also a lot of wounds there so we're you know it's pretty pretty sensitive and also beautiful. So I want to thank Fibershed and Rebecca for um, having us here today. It was really a wonderful experience and thank all the panelists and all of you for coming and listening and sharing story with us. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Rebecca. Yeah, we... Thank you to Sheena. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Fred and Alice. Um, want to um, just say that there's um, there's so much uh, deeply expressed in the way you described your practice that shares, I think with all of us, an ethic, a, a deep swath of ethics about how to be with um, the earth, how to be with um, our spirit bodies. And I just, I think that just being able for the design community who was asking you that last question about access to materials, um, I think it was Bailey Rose, um, one thing that I find really important in these conversations is what of the core ethics can we all start sharing and apply to our relationship with all materials? So that kind of reverence um, for materials, the prayers that go in to the material process, the material making process. I can't, I can only imagine what our world would look like if the core ethics that you bring into your basketry and weaving practices with cotton were imbued into all of the material culture that, that we are producing as humans on this planet. So even if the materials themselves remain remote, you know, like we need more cultural burning, we need more land access for you all to be able to do what you're doing. We need more space for the return of Mesoamerican cotton. But in the process, we have all these existing materials that are flooding the markets. And so why, you know, reversing and <laughs> turning around to those materials and creating reverence for them and care for them 
is what I'm learning from hearing you, you know, um, speak. And I look forward to more opportunities um, to support the return of burning um, and the return of um, the, 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 the plant beings that are so integral into the practice. In whatever ways we can, um, there are many producers in this community who do have access to land who want to be able to grow plants that support your practice. Doesn't solve the historical wounds at the deepest level, but it, um, it might be a start. Um, just wanted to say thank you. All right. Um, okay, well, I think at this point, we are all collecting back to this space. Um, let's see. Um, yes, the people are starting to come back now. They're just, they've just finished in the other room. So they're, they're coming over now. So if there's any questions you wanted to ask from this morning or answer from this morning or just chat about how things have been going, a lot of yeah. people will be going to break. Oh, thank you, Gavin. So there, there was um, a question from this morning that was focused on, um, you know, do we have enough natural fiber to clothe 7.8 billion people? <laughs> and Fred, um, Fred's vision that he had for working with the hemp plant, I think answers a lot. Fred, I'm going to say one quick thing about clothing humans with natural fibers that have what we call a decomposition pathway when we talk about it scientifically. But really what we're saying is we want to grow clothing that nourishes the soil at the end of its life and feeds another ecosystem. And when we think about hemp, um, I did the math, back of the envelope, you take 56 million acres that right in the middle of the country right now that has a lot of grain growing. If you just cycle hemp with those 56 million acres and you take just the finest grade textile fiber out of that, you can make 23 billion one pound garments just from rotating hemp into a wheat cycle. So if you think about the current lust for fossil carbon fibers, cause they're cheap, right? But if you start thinking about really investing in Fred's project to process the natural fibers um, and move the land into a healthier set of crop rotations, you have, you have more than we're even consuming now and we're over consuming. So Fred, I don't know if you wanted to, as people are coming in, chime in on hemp a little bit, but. Um. Oh my, we could go off. We need to have another panel discussion on, on that, Rebecca. I think yeah, there's so. a lot of opportunity there. We're seeing so much demand and so much need and the shift away from plastic. So what's the replacement? And it seems hemp, that's the one. And it's so versatile, like hemp clothing, hemp auto parts, hemp sustainable building materials. We're seeing so many different viewpoints at it. And that's the beauty of the hemp. It could be turned into so many different value added products. And then all the ideas, so many different ideas, it brings everyone together at one, just to love that one plant. So many different value added products. So it's just new, it just came out, right? It just went legal in 2018. Coronavirus shut it all down really so, but it's not gonna go anywhere. So we can't give up on it just yet. Agreed. Yeah, I think that answers um, some of the questions that came up about my initial presentation, which was, yeah, if we're gonna move to natural fibers, what are we gonna do? And we have so many opportunities um, to supplant that reliance on that, which we've been digging up from the core of the earth, the blood of the earth, <laughs> no longer needed. <laughs> Don't need to be doing that. So I think we have a core group here. Um, Everybody's and back. If you'd like to go to break, that'd be great. Okay. 